On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite our newest alumni, Dr. Andrew Sprite and Dr. Helen Spreet, to address convocation. Chancellor, honored guests, faculty, graduating students, relatives and friends. <clears throat> Helen and I are delighted to receive an honorary Doctor of Laws degrees from Western University. To, to receive such an honor from one of Canada's great universities is a special pleasure for us. Our oldest son, Paul, is a graduate of Western, and we are now in our 80s. And if age is a requirement, we are definitely qualified. <laughs> we were informed that most, if all, not all, of the graduating classes are from King's University College at Western, <clears throat> which to us is very appropriate. I was fortunate to have been a board member of King's for 10 years, two years as chairman. My most positive impression of King's was that it was a fiscally well-run institution with a mandate for social justice and human development. We were so impressed that Helen and I sponsored the Learning Commons in the new Student Life Center. It is so appealing it even has its own Tim Hortons concession. <laughs> King's provides a great student life experience. How do we know? Because our oldest grandson, a graduate of King's, told us so. As you will have concluded, we have decided that I would address the convocation for both Helen and I. Who are we and where did we come from? Helen and I are both products of southwestern Ontario from an area known as the Tobacco District <clears throat> surrounding the towns of Tilsonburg, Delhi, and Simcoe. We were both tobacco farmers' daughter, uh, children, and both our parents had immigrated from Belgium in the late 20s and early 30s. I graduated from Tilsonburg High School and went on to Queen's University graduating with the Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering in 1957. Helen graduated from Delhi High School in Commercial Studies and then joined the Bank of Montreal. She later went to Queens as my bride when I was in my final year. And she graduated with a PhD, putting hubby through. This month, on June 28th, Helen and I will be celebrating 62 years of marriage. <clears throat> if someone would ask us about our marriage and relationship over the 62 years, Helen and I would describe the experience as one of pure joy. I should get Helen's input on this. Helen, what do you say? I think you told me to say amen. <laughs> she says amen. <laughs> of course, she didn't say the old guy is getting awfully hard of hearing, which is adding a new and important dimension. Everyone needs to listen to and hear their spouse. We produced three children, Paul, the Western graduate, Nicole, Jeffrey and Jeffrey, who all married nice people. They each produced three delightful grandchildren. Two of our grandchildren are now married, and our oldest grandson, Jarrett, and his wife, Nicole, have provided us with our first great-grandchild. You could conclude that we are big on family. Now that you are up to date on family, we hope to offer you some meaningful words of wisdom 
as you go out into the world to live your life. When I think back on our lives and careers, one theme seems to run through our life and business successes. And that is, adversity provides opportunity. Adversity upsets the status quo and calls for action. To illustrate, I will take you to a few events in our lives. When I graduated in 1957, I obtained a good job in Toronto with Abitibi Power and Paper. We bought a house, had our first child, Paul, and settled in. I, wor I loved the work and the people, but a serious slump in the paper industry caused Abitibi to lay off much of its en engineering staff. And on the third layoff, I was out of a job. Adversity. I found a job at reduced pay at Shell Industries in Woodstock, but six, six months later, I joined a consulting firm, S.G. Chipman and Company, in London in 1959, where I was asked to design trunk sewers and a sewage plant for a new northern electric plant to be built in the city of London. Somehow, that was a long time ago. A new plant was built, utilized, but that plant has now been torn down. I loved the work, and the owner of the firm was great to work for, yet he had personal, marital, and business problems disturb disturbing him such that the firm ran out of work. It got to the point that I was owed three and a half months wages. Adversity again had reared its ugly head. I made the brilliant deduction that if I was going to work and not get paid, that I should work for myself. <laughs> so in 1961, I started the firm Spreed Associates, providing engineering services to the London area. As a farmer's son, we had a half a cow in the freezer, and we were on our way. Income the first six months was $500, but by the end of the year, we were very successful. Helen was my first secretary, answering the phone, typing drainage reports, making her own clothes, and being a wife and mother. Had Mr. Chipman not had his difficulties, I would have gladly continued to work at his firm rather than striking out on my own, because I was very comfortable there and being very well paid. Spreed Associates Engineers and Architects is still my business home today. The success of Spirit Associates funded many interests in many other businesses. In 1976, when design-build firms were coming to the fore, they were taking away important opportunities for our, from our consulting firm. Perhaps it could be described as a, an adversity in business. I started Norlon Builders as a design-build firm. Today it is a medium-sized construction company providing construction services to Western and throughout Ontario. It is prosperous and well-regarded. Again, adversity bringing opportunity. Perhaps the biggest example is the Vitex story. In 1962, I started London Building Products, a home improvement firm, the successor of which expanded with branches to serve all of Ontario and eventually became known as Andon Vinyl Products and the Andon Corporation. The introduction of vinyl siding by Andon Salesforce triggered the building of a vinyl siding manufacturing plant in London, Ontario. It was originally called Mastic Manufacturing and subsequently changed its name to Vitec Corporation. The story is much too involved to give you all the details. However, in 1989 to 1990, Vitec Corporation was struggling. And in 1989, 89, 90, it lost $1.6 million. The bank was very concerned and looked at the possibility of shutting Vitec down. They asked for more security. Vitec employed about 200 people, selling our products in Canada, the US, and also throughout outlets in Australia and New Zealand. 
The general business slump of the late 80s and early 90s was a horrible time for 200 people to lose their jobs. Serious decisions needed to be made. Adversity at its finest. After I provided $2 million additional security, they allowed us to carry on. We did have a couple of sleepless nights. Talk about adversity. We had many great employees, a great product, and encouraging sales in the, in the US. The decision was made to release our top two executives, a longtime general manager and the sales manager. Severance payment to the, them, to, to the two of them was substantial, as well as payment for the feasibility studies required from the bank, increased bank fees, lawyer fees, et cetera. The list goes on. We decided to run with the remaining personnel and business took off with profits for the next five years in the millions. In 1995, a suitor came along with an offer you couldn't refuse and the firm was sold. And thinking back, our concern for our people was a driving force in making our decision. Someone might describe it as being charitable. It is often said that the value one gives to charity comes back in many ways tenfold. In our case, our concern for our people was a major ingredient in our decision to put up an additional $2 million. The return on that $2 million five years later was more than 20 to 1. Almost unbelievable. I seem to have lost a page. <laughs> in going through the three important ingredients, going through life, there are th three important ingredients. There are love, hope, charity. Love is the greatest. Always have hope, but never forget charity. I repeat again, adversity brings opportunity. Helen, after looking after the needs of her husband and three active kids as a stay-at-home mom, had an interest in fine furniture and decorating. She and her sister Joyce started the Common Market, a fine furniture store which they operated for many years. In 1987, we decided to divide up our common business interests with Joyce, her sister, and her husband, Denny. As a result, Helen was out of a job. She tried to play the role of a lady of leisure playing tennis, golf, etc., And compared to business, she found it boring and depressing. To alleviate the problem, Helen and Sandra Schuster opened a small exclusive shop called Yorkville Interiors, selling drapery, wallpaper, and fine furniture. Again, adversity turned into action, which turned into opportunity. Helen enjoyed her career as a proprietor of the very elegant Yorkville interiors. Helen closed her shop when she turned 75, and now her main function is being our social director. I have other examples of adversity brings opportunity, but in my life, I think you get the message. Adversity gets you out of your comfort zone and stirs action. Action brings the possibility of positive results, and the rest is up to you. Now that have you, you have completed your university courses, you are somewhat educated and receiving degrees. You now need to find meaningful employment or a purpose in life that pays its way. It does not appear to be easy these days, but many opportunities exist, many probably unknown. Follow your dreams and find something you like to do. Work is then not work, but a pleasure. You won't work a day in your life. You know, I bounced into the office one day, full of life and energy, and someone related an incident that totally and instantly depressed me, such that I felt badly all day. Physically, I have not changed. 
I was disturbed, yet the only change was in my mind. Don't worry, be happy, as the saying goes. Employers love happy and enthusiastic people. Remember that happiness is a state of mind. Don't worry, be happy. Many of you will find meaning in meaningful employment in the ever-increasing civil service or quasi-civil service, teaching, policing, healthcare, etc., etc., etc. Pay is reasonably good and the benefits are generous. The others will need to find employment in the private sector with all its variable pains and successes. The potential for great financial success lies in the private sector. It is also the one which has the most adversity. Personal success, of course, is not dependent on money. We all have a role to play and define our niche in this world. You know, it's only fitting that Helen should have the last word. She was impressed by what someone said to another graduating class, and she would like me to repeat it for you. Keep changing the world. You are not the future, you are the present. Take ownership of your country. It's your watch now. Helen and I wish you every success in all facets of your life. There is a big, wide, exciting world out there. It is yours to enjoy, experience and enjoy. Thank you for listening and good luck.